All right, so uh, we gave an introduction to the Baroque and its origins um, as part of the Counter-Reformation and how it was expressed at St. Peter's. Uh, so let's talk a little more now about the Baroque architecture in Rome uh, as it develops. So we had talked about Bernini's work at St. Peter's, uh, but he was also an accomplished, as good a sculptor as he was, he was also an accomplished architect. And one of his most important works, not called St. Peter's, is a Sant'Andrea a Quarenal. Uh, this is in Rome from 1658, finished in 1670. So here is Bernini, a self-portrait. He was uh, another Renaissance man. He was a sculptor, an artist, an architect. Uh, he, he had it all. And, and he was a very popular um, figure. He uh, had, not only was he immensely talented, but he was, you know, he was kind of like the Raphael uh, equivalent in the Baroque period where he had charm and grace and he could kind of schmooze with clients uh, in order to get commissions and work. Uh, so, you know, he, you know, he looks like a kind of dapper young guy as well. And I'm going to contrast that with his rival because, uh, you know, we can't talk about uh, these guys without talking about their rivals. So let's talk about uh, San Andrea Guadalajara first. So this is a small church. This is nowhere near the size of St. Peter's, um, but it really reflects the principles of Baroque architecture and of the Counter-Reformation, the idea that the Catholic Church should ought to express a more connection to people and welcome people into the church. And he does this, again, quite literally, just like he did with the arms embracing uh, the faithful at the Piazza San Pedro. He does this here at San Quarinel um, with these, these walls, oops, get the pointer, with these walls that curve out. Uh, and they kind of draw you in. This is not set back with a deep piazza like St. Peter's does. It's just off the street, but he sets it back just enough to sort of draw you in with this concave curvature. But then we see a little bit off to the sides uh, a different form of curvature for the chapel itself. And on the front, we see a pretty traditional, here's a different view, uh, we see a pr pretty traditional Renaissance temple front here. Nothing, you know, too elaborate on the outside with a little half round uh, portico that stands out. But also look at the way that the stairs, they curve out even though the, um, even though the walls, they're, they're concave or convex uh, for the stairs at the entrance, but the walls are concave helping draw people in. I also want to point out the the um, buttresses, which have these scrolls, again, that we saw at Santa Maria Novella by Alberti. So if this isn't proof enough that you're going to be asked about Santa Maria Novella and who Alberti was, etc., cetera, um, I, I can't help you. <laughs> you. You know, that's going to be on your quiz. So here's a plan, and I think it's maybe even more obvious in plan, the way here at the bottom that he is building these concave curved walls to help create a, a little bit of a plaza to draw people in metaphorically. And then we see the convex curves of the entrance. And that's something that is going to be common in Baroque architecture as well, is not just a one curved form. Why stop at that? I mean, if you like a curved form, you might as well keep going. And so we get these contrasting different geometries and and curvatures. And so here we have the concave, but then we get inside and it's an oval plan, partly because it's a tight site. He doesn't have the depth to create a long nave, but all of a sudden now uh, the, the, the classical um, early Christian form of, of a deep nave and a transept and a apse and so forth, all of that is gone. And we just get this oval shaped chapel. Now it's small, it's not meant for a huge congregation anyway, but it's still a novel uh, shape uh, for a plan of a church. And he uses the axis of the short axis. Uh, here's the entrance on the opposite side now is the altar. And then the long axis here, um, you know, goes across that. And we've got little niches throughout for little small chapels and so forth. And on the interior, 
uh, we see the whole space is domed. Uh, the dome is kind of an odd shape. It's kind of like the Renaissance dome that was created by Brunelleschi at Florence. Uh, we see the ribs and so forth. We see a lantern. Uh, there's a drum that it sets on with windows that helps let in a lot of light. But because it's an oval shape, we kind of get these odd uh, shapes here um, and, and geometries. Uh, and then everything is gilded. This is Baroque. Uh, and you can tell that because everything is gilded. We have the coffers with, you know, high, highly decorated and the gilding. And then we have little angels and putti that are sitting up here. Even look around the uh, lantern at the base of that. We have little sculptural putti uh, in the top. Here's a detail. Uh, a little, you can see that a little bit better. Just, just some angels hanging out up in the heavens, right? Uh, and the light that comes in now becomes important. Here we have the light from the lantern dome. These are my photographs, so uh, they they pretty accurately portray the co the quality of light that's in this space. This sort of glow that comes from the lantern, and then most of the illumination coming from the windows at the base of the dome itself. And I want to show you the altar. Now, again, the altar is, you know, a Renaissance form of a classical temple front, uh, but it's par it's curved because the space is curved. And they even uh, Bernini even clips the the pediment of the altar and puts a introduces a curve into that. Uh, but what I really want you to notice is behind the altar. Look up in here. Now we see the same kind of sculptural elements that are similar to uh, what he did at St. Peter's behind that altar. But notice that there's a little glow of light occurring right here. And in fact, if you walk up close, slide here, if you walk up close and you look up underneath, there is another little lantern that is letting natural light in just behind the altar. Remember, this is an era before electric lighting. You can't, you know, you can't just spotlight the altar and the priest there. And so this is his way of doing that naturally. And so in a church service, the priest standing at this altar is being illuminated by light uh, directly as if he's being spotlighted. And this would have been a powerful visual to those uh, attending a service in this space here. And that is one of the ways that Baroque architects begin to use the, the power of light to send a message, uh, spend a spiritual message and a uh, sort of a um, uh, religious message, but using that, using the architecture and using light to do that. So in contrast, a similar church, uh, but by Francesco Borromini, is San Carlo al Quattro Fontaine. Uh, this dates from 1634, finished in 1667. And um, Borromini is the great rival to Bernini during the Baroque era, just like we talked about Gilberte and uh, Brunelleschi, and then later uh, the rivalry between Raphael and Michelangelo. These two guys also did not get along. They were competitors. Uh, they were both trying to get the same commissions of churches from the Catholic Church. Um, Borromini uh, was a very, very talented architect. Uh, Bernini was more known for his sculpture. Um, and uh, Borromini was probably more of the reclusive hermit-like figure. You can see he kind of has a more a wild look to him. Uh, his hair is a little fraggled, and he's you know uh, he looks a little little more wild-eyed than uh, Bernini did. So um, he wasn't quite the the hermit that Michelangelo was, but he had that similar kind of personality. Uh, but his great church, or one of his great churches, and again, it's not very large, is uh, San Carlo a Quattro Fontaine. And this is sets on a, on a four-way intersection in Rome, and it's called Quattro Fontaine because at each corner of the intersection was a fountain. And uh, the four fountains, uh, which is uh, the translation there in Italian. And so here we see on this corner is one of the fountains here. And these existed, and you know, Borromini isn't going to get rid of that. Uh, you know, then it would be the the three fountains. And so uh, he leaves that as part of um, incorporated into the corner of the ch church here. Uh, repeating that El Quattro Fontaine is the four fountains. Uh, so it's an intersection with four fountains, and Borromini keeps the fountain on his corner of the building. 
Otherwise, it would be the three fountains. So what is important, though, here is we see the facade of the church. Again, it's right on a street front. So we don't have the opportunity for a recessed piazza with the arms reaching out and embracing. But rather than just have a very flat, plain front, uh, Borromini introduces significant curvature to it uh, in order to break up an otherwise very plain facade. It's Renaissance in form, we see the classical columns, we see the classical entablatures and so forth, but nothing curved like this would have ever been done in ancient Greece or Rome. This is, an, or even really in the Renaissance, this is purely Baroque by having all of these curves introduced here. Here's a front view, kind of a, almost an elevation view. And you can, again, see that the curvature introduces a lot more visual interest and helps draw people. If it were just a flat facade, people might just walk right on by it and not think anything of it. But the curves really help it stand out, and that is a way to draw people in when you don't have a deep recess to work with. In fact, here is a, a rendering, uh, a more contemporary rendering. Uh, here's, a, you know, here's the intersection. Here you can see one of the other of the fountains on that corner. And you, know, you can see how flat the facades are. And then, boom, you have this immense curvature introduced. And that stands out. You know, as you're walking along the street, you see that uh, really pop out. And that draws your eye there. And therefore, it helps to attract you to the church, literally and figuratively. And plan, uh, it's really complex. This is actually a chapel to, I think it might be a convent or some religious order. So it's, it's not meant as a large church or anything. It's really just a, a chapel for the members of that order. And there's a courtyard and, a, and this is part of the, um, the, the convent or whatever itself. And, but the, the church element is this element here in the upper left. So here's the entrance here. You can see that curvature that he introduces. And in this case, it's not quite an oval form like we saw at, um, uh, with Bernini, uh, but, but it has sort of that same geometric form like an oval might have. But now we're using the long axis uh, with the altar on the opposite end of the long axis from the entry. And the short axis uh, then has a couple of chapels off to the side. And if I show you the images of it, uh, the geometries are really complex in here. Um, he doesn't just have an oval shape and continue that straight up. He introduces ex significant amounts of geometries and counter geometries. You get a concave. If you have a concave curve, he needs to introduce a convex curve to counter that. Uh, and it forces a lot of dynamic action. You know, if you have, it's, it's like physics. If you have one action, there is going to be a counter reaction to that. And, and Borromini is the master of doing that. And it creates a visual um, a hot mess <laughs> in some cases. He's, he's good enough that it, it all works together, but you could see that one could easily get carried away if you really didn't know what you were doing. And he has no computer modeling to work off of. All of this is coming off of drawings uh, that are you know, put down on parchment paper. Uh, here is a view up on, of the dome. Again, sort of an oval-shaped dome with a lantern lighting in lots of natural light. This isn't as gilded uh, as uh, many Baroque churches we will see. Uh, that's okay. It's still highly decorated, highly decorated, highly ornamented, and that alone makes it Baroque. Uh, but all of these different curves and geometric forms also are um, evocative of what makes something Baroque in architecture. Here's a section cut through it. Uh, so the entrance is over here on the right. Uh, you can see in, in you know, two-dimensional form, it looks like a more Renaissance element uh, with a sort of elongated uh, dome here. There's a lantern on top, but it is in fact in three dimensions where the Baroque elements come through. Here's a plan showing some of the geometries. Remember, I talked about the importance of geometry in planning to the Renaissance architects. Uh, with Borromini, it becomes an obsession. And it isn't just, you know, what can we inscribe within a, a simple square? He's got uh, triangles, he's got circles, he's got squares, he's got 
parallelograms, you know, you name it uh, in geometry, and Borromini adds it in. And in fact, if we take if we really break it down into uh, this plan into its different geometric elements, you can see just how complex this is. Uh, this takes a an extensive knowledge of of geometry and mathematics and planning in order to put all of this together and create something that architecturally is a unified design. And it really, I think, helps to express how talented Borromini is. Another great example is Santivo della Sapienza. Uh, this is also in Rome from the 1640s. This is a chapel at the end of a courtyard Again, not a major church per se. And again, looking at the plan, you can see the complexity of the geometry. He's doing it. He has a different geometric plan going on here. And he's actually using two equilateral triangles together. And I'll show you in a moment uh, how that works. But you can begin to see some of the geometric elements. Uh, you also notice at the entrance down here at the bottom is a concave curvature form, just like we saw with his rival Bernini. And then at the entry is a convex curvature for the portico and steps leading into the entrance. So um, even though they were rivals, they weren't above uh, you know, borrowing from each other uh, good ideas. So here we see the geometries laid out for Santivo al Sapienza. Um, here is uh, the triangles. Uh, and then he begins to clip the ends of the triangles and introduce curvatures, either convave, concave or convex. Uh, and then it, you know, as you develop that, you begin to create this very complex geom geometry for the plan itself. So here's a few views of it. This is in the courtyard. We see the loggias on the sides, very typical Renaissance loggia, but the curved form of the front is Baroque, right? And so this concave curve welcoming you in towards the church. Uh, it's not as dramatic a portico, but the steps are concave, can't quite tell that. But then look at the contrasting geometries of the drum uh, behind it here, uh, where you have this being concave, this is almost convex on, and so it's that push and pull action reaction that is so typical of Baroque architecture. And we can see that even more clearly as you get closer and closer to it. Um, you know, the concave curvature here contrasted with uh, a complex but convex curvature of the chapel itself. Uh, here is a section cut through that. Again, when you look at it three-dimensionally, it looks more classical Renaissance. It has that foundation in the Renaissance, but it is all of these curvatures and geometries working together to create something that is more Baroque in architecture. And a nice view of the dome here. Uh, this is... Um, really complicated geometries in the dome. It isn't just a simple oval like we saw at some of those earlier examples. We have these various geometries. Uh, so it makes it a very complicated construction here. Uh, the ribs are expressed with columns, but they actually taper uh, as they get towards the top, and that helps to create an illusion of a taller dome than it really is. It's really not that tall, but it makes, you know, Borromini uses this little trick of design to make it appear much taller than it is. Okay, I think we'll stop here uh, before we jump into some of the urban planning that we'll see in the Baroque era. Talk about that.